What is up, everybody? It's been a while after this whole Christmas break, but I'm excited to be back and uh, ready to record. We got episode 34 here uh, with Golden Dice Podcast, and with me, I have the uh, the dynamic duo. Can't catch them anywhere unless they're together. Tommy and Scott, how are you guys? <laughs> What's up, Jack? How you doing? I'm well. Where did that come from? That was, you know, it's a little <laughs> odd intro. <laughs> this is your I'm going to curse now a lot, so you got you to gotta, you gotta edit things out. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah I should be right. nicer to Scott on these podcasts. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get some eight-year-olds mad at me. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Um, so mad that they so go the back story, She trolled me through Flockton after she yeah. beat him. It's a pretty so good the, troll. The, the backstory to that is that we were in a, a few weeks ago, the first week, the, the fifth, I believe, the first Saturday. I went to a Virginia regional, and there was a, a family there. It was a uh, the parents and the two kids and this eight-year-old girl. Oh, I was talking to Todd at first from Knights of Ren and she was joking about how he curses. And then she turned to me and she's like, yeah, and you have to blank out Scott a lot too, or like something along those lines. I was like, I know they're starting to become pretty close on the amount of, uh, well, I guess Knights of Ren does the uh, Utinis and we do the Wilhelm screams, but uh, it's starting to get close, especially that last episode. I couldn't like, it just, I like broke a dam. It's like, you know, the little Dutch boy sitting with his finger in the thing and the Dutch boy ran away and then just, brah. (laughs) Well, I mean, to add on to that eight year old girl thing too, as well, one of our buddies Flockton came down with us and she beat him in like round four or five. And the entire time she was saying what she was doing and why she was doing it. Like she probed him, got rid of his mitigation. She's like, I'm doing that. So you can't resolve my dice. And here's 15 damage. (laughs) Or remove my dice. (laughs) Flockton. Flockton's like internally screaming after that. He's like, yeah, I'm going to have a beer. So uh, that's how his day went. And the backstory yeah, so, for that. Uh, as a, as a, uh, as an aside, if you're playing in a tournament, you're not used to playing in a tournament, you know, just talk through what you're doing as you're doing it. It's not a, not a bad practice from the stamp. Maybe don't say why you're doing it, but it's not a bad <laughs> uh, from the standpoint of making sure you make uh, the correct plays and you play correctly. I mean, it's also, it's just like, Floxen's just one one of a kind, you know? Tommy was over for testing the other day, and he even said, he's like, what I would give to see, like, the world through Flockton's eyes for just, like, a few hours. I have no idea. How- that would be, <laughs> up would be down, and left would be right. I, I just don't know. I love him to death, but man, sometimes I just have no idea what's going inside that head. Like, you, old well, Tommy, you were over for this. Right before Virginia, he was running a... Uh, the uh, Han Iden deck, and his reason for running Iden was because it counters Ray One really well. <laughs> I'm like, dude, what, what Ray One deck are you playing against? Like, oh, he's adorable. <laughs> he's so cute. He's, has he's lucky. has he's he ever cool played cool against Ray One? Uh, yeah, Joe made that Luke Luke Three Ray One deck for a little bit, but I think that's the extent of it. All right, but then, that's... then he proceeds to say he counters the meta with the ID Ten Droid because he gets to get rid of cards. It's just like, like that's it. Like, what meta is that countering? That's just a good play. Like, yeah. So I I counter the meta by dealing damage. <laughs> uh. I countered Vader really well by dealing fifteen damage to him. It was really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I'll I'll. Uh, I mean, since we last recorded, I had two regionals that I was at, and I'll quickly go through Virginia and and quickly Connecticut as well. Uh. Virginia, not too much to note. In Connecticut, I did a write up as well, so you can check our Facebook page uh, to take a take you to our WordPress um, for that. But Connecticut, I went five two with Kid Ayla. Uh, the deck felt all right. It it lost real hard to Mill, and I got rolled off by Han Kier. So I did five two, and I did my usual bubble out. And that whole week, I I didn't get to test. And then Tommy and Scott and Brian come over Friday night, and this is where the magic happens. The magic of me going 0 and 5 that night, not winning a single game. Uh, I I won one, but we realized Scott didn't take shields. So yeah, well that was uh, that was the night before Connecticut, wasn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, after Virginia. Now this is happening. This okay, is the night so before Connecticut, yeah, he's this is after man, five two with Kid Ayla. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're all blending into one regional. So so hold on, are we recapping Virginia or Connecticut now? I'm I'm confused. We're starting to move in Connecticut, Virginia. Gotcha. I just said I went five two with Kid Ayla. Uh, I mean, it was fun. Uh, what won that? Um, uh, Minion won that with his Yoda yeah. Leia. Yeah, there was a, that. Basically, that the the things of note to take 
from the Virginia is that Mill returned. Uh, both Cody uh, and Drew from ABG uh, made top cut, as well as Menyon, who won the whole thing with Mill. So Mill versus Vader is a win- very winnable matchup. That's that's the, the biggest takeaway uh, from Virginia, in my opinion. Hey, Jack. Hey, Scott. Who, uh... Who TO'd the, the top cut of Virginia? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, the, the TO had to bounce, so I just kind of, I, I was the TO. You, Jack was the TO, who didn't start <laughs> the event as any level of uh, judging participant, who has zero relationship with the store. Yeah, that's... So, that's store, a, store has zero relationship with Destiny. They don't even yeah. have a weekly. They're just like, yeah, we just got picked to host yeah, this that, big store. That, <laughs> That's that's who FFG is giving regionals to stores that don't even run Destiny events that don't have a Destiny crowd that can't even be bothered to have a TO stay through the entire an event an event that they knew was going to last more than the TO shift. Also, I Just, mean another thing yeah. that's that's bothering me is I'm fine with events being capped. Like if you only have space for 64, by all means it should be capped at 64 because no one wants to play on top of one another. But um, you know with a lot. A handful of the East Coast uh, regionals last year had almost 100. They were in the 90s, you know, like the mid to upper 90s, some of them. So I don't know why we're limiting ourselves. I know that I know for a fact that there were some people that didn't get to play um, at this regional that tried to get in. Um, So I I think it's interesting that we're, you know, we're saying, oh, you know, the turnouts for regionals are down. But if we're capping them all at 64, I mean, yeah, they're going to be down when we had 90 some at a handful previously i think the only regional not capped was connecticut so far um, even yeah. across the country, which is crazy like, now yeah. is is the jersey one capped because i know that that one had like 98 last year or 93 or something like that not sure i hope not i read on the uh post today that i, I didn't see anything written about it being capped yeah i'm sure we can figure that out but um yeah, I I would hope it wouldn't be. It's weird that they are all of a sudden capping. I think my biggest frustration with Virginia, somebody said it was like a fire hazard. Uh, that was a rumor that I heard floating around, but I I don't remember hearing that confirmed by the store. Uh, but that could be just me not not knowing. But ultimately, that- there was one guy set like, uh, so shout out to Nate, and I did, said this in my article as well. He ended up topping in Connecticut. But Virginia, he went there with him and his buddy. His buddy got in because he, he knew to message, but Nate didn't realize like you had to message them. He thought, you know, just saying he was attending the Facebook event would have reserved a spot, but uh, it didn't work out. And so he, he now had to stay because his buddy was in the tournament and he sat around for all uh, seven rounds of it and just kind of toughed it out. But I was like, really? Like we, we can't do 65, like 65 isn't going to break the fire code. Okay. Somebody has a buy, like whatever, like just, (laughs) I I thought that was frustrating. My, my problem is if if FFG is putting on their regional forms, whatever they may be, they should be asking, you know, what's your what's your maximum attendance? What would you cap this event at? And if if you're capping it at 64 and other venues are saying, you know, we're not capping it or we can support 100 plus, I, I would imagine or, you know, we have a TO or a local or a weekly local event. You know what I mean? I would imagine that no, those they- things would they, they, <laughs> they clearly are not because we've seen a bunch of regionals come out and be like, oh, we're going to cap it at 32. Yeah, that's insane. You know, it's like you, that, that, that's it's, insane. it's, you know, capping it. You know, if you if I'm, I'm fine, as long as they communicate a cap, I don't really care so long as it's not below the threshold that FFG sends for the event, which is, I believe, the 64. But not. Yeah, you prize. The, they prize the 64. Not having a TO for the entire event. Like. What? You know, I I get yeah, it. I get didn't... it that with we're we're basically playing like schoolyard basketball, call your own fouls, anyway, because tos aren't going to actively to to begin with. But having having, you know, Jack Jack knows the rules. Jack, you know, he'd be a fine to if he were the to. But to have someone have to to the top cut, what if something had happened that Jack had to make a call on? He doesn't have. Let's just say, like, if it's a family emergency or something, like, obviously that's that's fine. That's fine. But you know, if you're tired because it was a long day, yeah, that's that's this, this was them saying right. we don't want to pay someone for the entire event, even though we're charging like a fee to have people attend this event. But what if? Yeah, the guy said he couldn't work yeah, past eight hours. If if Jack 
had to make a call. Jack does not have the re- relationship with the store for the store to back Jack up on that call. And I, you know, it's there could be it could have been something completely innocent, like a person, you know, not shuffling a card into their deck and realizing halfway through Jack has to make a call. Or we've seen it in previous things. We what well, the the most um, specific example of it was that one of those first big store championships. I think down maybe like Texas or something, the guy with the, the loop deck pulling cards from his discard pile on stream. Like, stuff like that could happen. And if, you're, if your TO doesn't know the store, then the TO can't do anything at all. Especially if it were to be like to the a, a, a DQ level. Like, it just, it just boggles yeah. my mind that, you know, TOs are leaving halfway through the event and there's no replacement TO. The store just doesn't have a TO set up. Hey man, I got Vader shields and a, an extra tolls and spot glass out of it. So, you know, I was excited, (laughs) but yeah, that was, it it was crazy that a TO would leave, uh, mid event. And that, I mean, that just comes down to the stores they're picking. Like Tommy was saying, you know, stores with a community of some sort should, uh, should have a TO. And, and the guy, he was trying his best, you know, credits him for, um, being involved while he was there, but there were certain things where he just like didn't know either. Like the whole can Grievous have mods on him came up, and no, he can't. But it took a while for him to look that up. And there was um, like the whole Vader fist thing, you know, power actually in it back in with Vader, you know, spotting Vader's not optional. So there were a few things in which he had to be explained to um, about stuff. And I think me streaming kind of helped that. And also, you know, the Knights of Ren guys kind of have a name in ABG mm-hmm. as well. Uh, we're able to give credit to those, you know, what, you know, what the correct ruling was. But I mean, like the Grievous Mod thing, you know, they weren't sure about it. Some people in the crowd thought it was OK because they thought it was a play restriction. But I was like, you know, if th- that was that was clarified within that online form and also in the recent rule reference. So it was uh, a little hazy. I mean, that's what just happens when the T.O. Like they don't even have to be like an avid player like there every week. But like, you know. They have to play the game in some form. It's, I would yeah, it's, but. yeah. Like, it's, there's, there's absolutely, like, duh, FFG doesn't have a judge program or anything, but they don't even have, like, bare bones. Like, does your TO play this game? At least, at least it, there's a chance that with them pushing back worlds, or, you know, there's some, some rumors that potentially they're reworking their entire OP. So let's hope for that. Oh, okay. Yeah, we could touch on that. And uh, towards the end of the episode as well, too. I want to hear your guys' thoughts on the the world's change and what's hopeful. But uh, we'll, we'll breeze through uh, Connecticut as well, and then we can just kind of get into the general meta gist of things, unless anybody had any other thoughts on the, nah. the store selection of TOs or anything I mean, I like could that. Go on, like, I could go on for hours <laughs> on this topic, but we're just going to – we'll hit That's him as why Jack breezed through Virginia. That's, that's why I'm trying to segue. <laughs> um yeah so virginia finished i didn't have much time to test in the lead up to connecticut and um i just kind of was going to go with kayla because that's what i played the week before but uh again i got stomped by uh by vader by uh scott where was it lando wedge you were running and also by tarkin snoke um so nothing was really going well at all um and i was just kind of defeated at that point and Tommy's like, dude, I think, like, I don't know. He's like, maybe I'm crazy, but maybe this is it. I was like, all right, Tommy, can you stay for, like, one yeah, more he, game? Watch he me made play Tommy Vader. Stay up. And I had to play Vader, which is not <laughs> something I enjoy doing. Well, it was really funny because you were frustrated at Brian's build. You're like, do you have bait and switch? Oh, yeah, I kept on, like, I would get through the entire hard. deck, and I'm like, where the f- <laughs> card at? <laughs> ding, ding. There's one. <laughs> Hey, that that's a that is an area that deserves uh, yeah. one of those. But that was, it's. I mean, it's it's fine. You can, you can get away with a lot of stuff with a, uh, you know, with a what's it called build with a uh, Vader build. Well, you got you got a saber in there. You got the fist in there. Yep. You can get away yeah, with it's highway murder. One of those decks that can do that. But yeah, the, so the testing went poorly that yeah, night. Sure, I, I tried sure. it out, and I went. I think I won both games against Vader. I don't really remember though, but it, it felt. Yeah, you won both games because the, the first game you, like, I I made the so all right. If you're staring down, what is going to be a four discard side, and you have a hidden motive in your hand, 
even though the discard sides don't make up the most chance to remove the dice, you still have to call discard. You can't play that game of, I'm going to call this other thing because it's more likely to roll that. No, if you are calling something because you need them to not be on that side, you need to call that and side. And then I want to let everybody know that as the Tarkin player, when you do roll the focus, you then have the cue that your opponent has extremely limited removal or no removal left. So then you focus your other die into potentially the discard so that they really only have a window to play one more card. Or, you know, you, maybe if you have a fist in hand, you go to resources. You can, you can get greedy with that focus and the, and the Snoke power action at that point. Yeah. At, at least I would have forced you to cannibalize some of your dice sure. to get to the same result. And I still would have been able to play the the Vader saber that yes, I was trying to. Protect. But I just want I just want to point that out that if if that happens and your opponent calls calls something like discard because they're that afraid of it, then you you may want to take the cue that hey they don't have hard removal, maybe and and they're afraid of having their hand ripped, so maybe it's worth spending two dice to rip the entire hand. Yeah, it it definitely depends on the given situation because. I mean, if you're using both Tarkin dice too as well to rip the hand, then you might slow down your damage output. But again, depends on the deck. Against a vehicle deck, if you can rip their first hand, you're probably uh, feeling okay. Well, against a... It depends what vehicle deck. Cause some vehicle decks, if they're playing Armored Reinforcement and they get one thing out of their hand, then... Well, even then, if they if it's like the Fire Spray deck and you, you rip their mods, you know, you're going to feel okay. Yeah. Especially if it's a TLT. Yeah, you're going to feel okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, so that that was what kind of happened there, and then I managed to rip Vader Saber and some other stuff. But yeah, um, so yeah, that was the first game, and then second game, um, it was a lot closer. I forget exactly what happened, but I think I ended up pulling out. But either way, it was like, all right, two guns against Vader. I'm good. Let's do this. Connecticut. I was like so nervous rolling into it, but I won't really dive into the specifics because again, uh, I wrote an article on Connecticut, and that is up on our Facebook that you can uh, check out with the. Um, uh, on our Facebook, yeah, to check out on WordPress and just see the specific matchups and uh, kind of report to the top eight. Um, I was on stream for top eight, top four in the finals. So y- if you're looking to watch some of the deck too, um, you could check it out. Bear with the stream a little bit. They relegated us to Wi-Fi instead of a hardwire, uh, which kind of stinks, but Oof. it is what it is. Um, yeah, I don't remember their exact reasoning. It didn't make too much sense to me, but it was whatever. Yeah, it was like something that they were like, there oh, we couldn't find ours. I was like, but I have one. And they're like, well, you know, uh, we would have to run <laughs> into the security room or something like that. And I was like, I don't I don't understand. <laughs> like, if you could have run yours, why can't you run mine? But anyways, um, I mean, I, they did a good job at hosting. The event was real, uh, well run. Uh, the TO didn't leave. He was there, all that good stuff. So uh, uh, it was good. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the, the deck just worked. I was surprised at how well i did i had a lot of luck getting there uh but more so not surprised at the deck but just surprised at uh only having two reps with it previously i mean you'll see in my notes like on that report like I, in one of the rounds i played like jink uh jin yoda uh which was interesting but i kind of won because he had a few misplays and let me anger dice that i shouldn't have been able to anger and also try to play removal when i had stifle out so then i resolved damage for the win when he could have taken shields um a few things like that. And then like the top eight against Joe was the second game was uh, super close, but I got lucky uh, with a probe to hit a, um, a mind trick. And I got lucky at the end of game two when I rolled out and I needed two damage and he was just looking for matching sides for the power action. Um, but instead, uh, well, since he was looking for that, he did not notice the two indirect sitting from Tarkin's dice. Um, so he resolved to die and then I resolved mine and won the game. So he had misplays on that. Uh, I think top cut is Cody as well. Dude, Snoke's disrupt comes in clutch, man. I'll tell you that. Uh, but yeah, overall, it was a good event. We had uh, 65 people there. A lot of fun, as always. But uh, Tarkin Stoke, man. Well done, Tommy. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Well done to you. You piloted it. I wasn't surprised you did as well as you did for the simple reason that you have familiarity with Tarkin. I mean, you played a, a little bit of Tarkin 7th, and you played a lot of Snoke after Battle Droid, and this is basically a hybrid of the two decks. They basically achieve the same thing that those decks did. You just aggressively pump out damage and outpace your opponent. Yeah. And I mean, you kind of pulled it out too. It's just like uh, that three wide of Snoke 
doing just all that indirect was kind of dead. So now, um, you know, being able to bring Tarkin in and be able to mass produce that indirect and just shove it in people's face in this, this too wide, um, like meta was just obviously valuable because a lot of decks, one, weren't expecting to take like 12 damage from a chance cube for speed and four character dice. Yeah, you, you could make the most of some really crappy dice. Um, and we also, in testing against Mill, it, it seems decent because you kind of can make something out of nothing. Now, Mill can really hurt you with uh, just patiently shielding up, but if they try to get too aggressive, you can kind of make them pay. You also have a ton of focus sides, so you don't need uh, a large amount of rerolls to really hit solid damage on any particular turn. Yeah. And you're still dealing damage. All you have to do is match up two sides. They don't have to be any particular sides, and you still deal something. Yeah, and and I mean, Wave is in there for that matchup too, hopefully, so that you yeah. can just you have something that can deal a lot of damage. And in they're a short they're never they're never killing one of your characters. So your Snoke actions on the table the entire time. Your your Tarkin power actions on the table the entire time. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I mean, the, the the scary part about the deck when we put it together and on the table for the first few times is when we were hitting like, you know, 11 or 12 damage turn one, we were like, oh, okay, that happened, you know, the last three or four games. That's kind of crazy. You know, <laughs> it was like I did it different ways. One time we did it with fist. One time we did it with a cannon and, you know, some zero cost upgrades. You got a lot of ways to get to that uh, that crazy damage ceiling. Yeah. I mean, I, I was certainly impressed with it when I finally got to get games. I was never as high on the the Tarkin seventh that you and and Joe were much higher on back. Uh, that was Legacy's meta, I believe, around World. Because yeah, because yeah, Joe brought Seven Sister Tarkin two Worlds. Um, but I mean, just Tarkin with Snoke is just so so good. I mean, Snoke's obviously still a valuable character even with the plus one. It's total totally different animal. Totally different yeah. animal. Yeah, I mean, I, I liked it a lot, and I felt like the package, and I mean, the crazy thing is, though, is that we felt good into Vader, or at least okay, and then I get o <laughs> in the Yeah, the I top. mean, you got hit with those hidden motives um, from when I watched in the stream. I mean, he removed your fist eye twice with that on a 33% chance when it was shown lethal both times, so. Yeah, definitely frustrating. I mean, if you're, if, if Vader's winning a ton of things, um, so Vader is fully capable of winning any matchup it gets into. It just has to do Vader things. Yeah. And I think we're starting to like most people are starting to admit that Vader is like the deck rather than the gatekeeper. Um, and it's, it's interesting too, because I don't think a single person that predicted that Vader was going to be this good, not only just when he was spoiled, but even after the Snoke nerf. Like after the Snoke nerf, I don't think anybody really was like, uh, like I mean, I, I'm looking at um, Ira Bell's 2018-19 regional championship results, and after the rules reference update, Vader Greedo has won 12 regionals. Vader three Greedo, yeah. Um, and I don't think anybody predicted that in any shape or form. Uh, people still thought Mill was kind of be the top dog, and Mill obviously is still good, but it's like. The next closest is Snoke after Battle Droid with Bitter Rivalry and the three wide mill, both with two wins. It's just like... And we know one of those was in Hawaii with nine people. For the Snoke after Battle yeah. Droid, yeah. Mm. yeah. Now, I'm, so, sure, I'm I, sure a handful of those Vader ones weren't at uh, you know massive events either. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... It, the reality of it is people... We came to that conclusion because there isn't much wiggle room within the deck as far as finding differing avenues of of doing things with it so the expectation is if there's not a lot of wiggle room then its ceiling is low because you can't necessarily leverage it more but the fact of the matter is it just doesn't need to be leveraged well it's fun testing against tommy with vader the other night he rolled out vader got like a three three plus four on the saber Next round, got a four, 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 and he's like, "Oh, this is how this deck wins." <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's like the thing about it. And I feel like, um, I mean, you've seen people kind of go back and forth again, still whether or not it's the top deck or it's a gatekeeper or whatever. Kind of, I mean, it's semantics at this point. Ultimately, he's got twelve wins, but it just doesn't feel like the dominating, like the dominating decks in the past. I feel like you could see a lot of good plays happening and and that's not to take away from every vader player like obviously a 
good player with Vader is going to do extremely well. But Vader decks, I feel like, just can cover up some uh, some misplays and um, you know inefficiencies. Uh, just because of his Would dice. you say it feels a little more like Sabine, Jack? No, no. I think it's even <laughs> easier because Sabine had 11 health and two damage sides and not no, a double I, resource. No? Sabine was way more fragile, although she had second chance. Don't trigger me like that. Yeah, I had to pay three resources for that. All right, man. Don't talk to me. It's real tough with Moss's Vault. It's so tough. Hard. No feed, dude. No feed back so then. <laughs> That's true. Feed is disgusting. Without feed, Vader might not even be as good because the turns where he gets fist out turn one, the math just doesn't work out for him. Well, I mean, since, since we're bringing it up, feed has got to go. Yeah. Got feed's to gotta go. Get <laughs> out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, Oh, it, it's all right. So you want to say like, all right, Vader's winning X percentage. I think what, like 40, 20 or whatever the percentage was. And like Snoke Tarkin was winning 72. How, what do you think the percentage is of feed on the tape? Like, how many games do you think there are where there's feed, which one of the two battlefields could be feed? It's it's like All 85%. Of them? It's, gotta be, yeah. it's probably it, like 95%. It, well, no, I'm saying like 85% of the decks are bringing feed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's 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 nutty. The other and, 15 are uh, Weapons Factory yeah. Alpha. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah and, Maybe yeah, 13, that's, and then there's 2% that's yeah. not. And what's, what's the commonality between those two? You both get an extra resource, essentially. Yep. Um, but you know, and the reason people are bringing weapons factory alpha is so that their opponent doesn't get feed. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a problematic battlefield cause it's that many, you know, it's, it's being run by that many things. If anything is that much of an auto include over all of the other decks, it's a problem. And it's a problem because it's something that's generically powerful, a resource. Every deck wants more resources. It's always going to be good. So it's there. You don't need to build around it to get to it. And it's generically available. You don't need to do anything special to get it. Weapons Factory Alpha, you need to have certain cards in your deck. You need to have certain cards in your hand. And it's not an actual resource. It's a discount. Whereas with Feed, you don't have to do anything. It just has to be on the table and you have to control it. And you get a resource for whatever purpose you want. Mitigation, you know, playing extra upgrades, whatever, whatever you want. It's there. And Vader is probably the best deck uh, for winning the battlefield role. Um, he's got one of the highest uh, expected values, but then also his variance is pretty low because if you just don't roll blanks on Vader, you're guaranteed a four. You know, if, if you know, that's just your your floor, your average floor is pretty, pretty high there. So Vader's going to win that more often than not. And Vader gets a big advantage from having three resources to start the game. You're dropping a Vader Saber turn one, or... All you got to do is resolve one Vader dice, and you're dropping a Fist turn one. Both of those, the Fist especially, is probably the strongest first round play in the game, presently. And Vader's doing it pretty easily, and his Fist is probably one of the better Fists. His Do you mean like r Fist with Vader's? Yes. Better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's his Fist, yeah. and it's Vader's Fist. Yeah, it's, card. it's his, dude. Uh, a side note rules on that in case people don't know it's been talked about but I figured I might as well bring it up but if you power action that back in with Vader you have to roll the die and turn it to a different side uh, than what it rolled that spot is not optional yeah so spot, just a side the note. spot's not optional and because you have to turn the dice it can't be on the same side that it just rolled so if you rolled yep. what it what you wanted you gotta flip it to something else interesting play though if you have no resources no cards and it's on the resource side, and you haven't power actioned it yet, you could power action it and just turn it to the three. Or an unpaid side, if you wanted. If it's already in the pool. Yeah, you just do as much as you say. Yeah. I mean, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, like, Vader's just like, I mean, like you said, being able to realistically start with a Vader Saber or a Fist is just above the curve of, like, anything a deck can do. And then even if it doesn't, like, that is probably the perfect friends and high deck, because you just need Vader's dice, and then Greedo can maybe help out if you need it. But I'm not talking about Vader. We're talking about feed. Well, I meant like feed on top of that. Yeah. Like the fact that the amount of re free resource value you can get out of that deck. Like if you turn one feed, play Vader Saber, and you have friends in high, like you're guaranteed, obviously, to to hit that seven. And it's like if you take away feed, now you kind of relegate him to uh, like a two drop, which clearly like an ancient Saber, while good, is not nearly as it's powerful. It's not a Vader Saber. Or a fist. Like, or a fist. It's, yeah, it's not. 
No, I, I, I agree. I think something and, has to be done. And first turn ancient used to be like the power play because you didn't have three resources. It, Theed, Theed, I don't, they just got it. It's, I just, if they were to ban it, just tell everybody to rip everyone up, I'd be, I'd be pretty happy. Just be, <laughs> yeah. We don't do bans here, Scott. Yeah, they're going to do it's some. It's going to be around. Right. It's going to be around. They're going to do some roundabout thing. All right, whatever they want to do with it, do it like now rather than later. Errata it to a blank text. Guys, we don't ban cards. We <laughs> just errata them. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't ban cards, but uh, it's a trap. Is It says, you know. Pay a resource. Yeah, throw it at, <laughs> rip it into a million pieces and light it on fire. Place your beer on me. Yeah, basically. Well, that's what it would tell me. It would tell you to place your water. I, I mm. prefer you who, Jack. Thank you. Oh, you. Yeah. That's right. Sorry. Sorry about Out that. Out of a juice box. But, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you guys have been listening to uh, mainly Arrowbrook, and I know it's really funny to watch Cody get on there and just go go to town on Vader and how much he hates that. Oh, it's that, I, that's just that. entertaining. I, I, love, I love listening to Cody talk about Vader, actually. <laughs> Well, this week was a little disappointment because it had Vader in the title, but Cody wasn't in the episode. <laughs> I'm almost mad that you beat Cody because it would have been really funny to like have to have him face Vader in the finals because he would have hated every second of it, even if he won. And then if he lost, it'd be really like, oof. So <laughs> a solo ABG episode would just go to... While we're on the topic, I just want to take full blame for the name of the deck that ABG and I think... Uh, Mike and all hate the name of uh, Snoke and Hot Mess. You guys can call it whatever you want if you think it's even worth naming. So just put that out there. I'll take yeah. the blame. Jack's not bad at naming Dex. He's just a good player. <laughs> Tommy had that I, name like he 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 was hard on that name to begin. Like he just was like, no, I got it. It's named it's called, uh, called you Snoke to, and Hot Mess. <laughs> you had to go with hard for that one. Yeah, he's rigid. Okay, just. <laughs> 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 He's really he's really sticking it in there with that deck. Yep. That deck. All right. Wow. Um, <laughs> he's, he's rigid in his naming conventions. Do you got Do you guys think we're going to continue to see this deck? Do you think it's going to stick around? Do you think? Uh, it, do you think it can stand up to Vader? What What are both of your opinions on it? Truthfully, I th- need to go back to not the drawing board, but I need to test more against Vader, and see how it goes. But as I, my current opinion is that yes, this deck should stick around. Um, I, I think it's, it felt that good at least. I mean, to go five and two in Swiss and only having two reps before it, like, I, I just think it's extremely powerful. All right, uh, Scott, it's not the dumbest think? thing you've ever come up with. Well, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. No, I, I mean, I, th- I've, what I've played against it more often than not and i think it's you know definitely got um if, what we figured like if you're only doing eight damage on the first turn that's like on yeah that's it's a bad, bad day turn. yeah well yeah, anything taking eight damage even if it's not directed even if it's distributed out especially with um most decks being too wide so they don't necessarily have that like repository of even if the health numbers are the same they don't have that ability to spread it out as much to keep characters alive so so i'll say this in in regards to the vader matchup i think that uh in the two wide matchups typically you just can you know turn up the heat and melt face with your indirect damage and and for the most part you'll be okay um in the vader matchup specifically there's a lot of sequencing involved. We have a lot of tech cards that are very, very good in that matchup, um, but they they rely on you doing a very uh, certain sequence to every turn, and they require you to at least at one point in the game get out in front of Vader. And usually, it's it's got to be going into the second turn. You need to claim the battlefield because more often than not, you're going to lose the battlefield roll. They're going to take uh, feed power action and. Uh, you're going to let them take their power action off feed, which is going to slow them down slightly. You need to get Tarkin in the pool, get your angers online, get your discard off Tarkin power action online, force them to remove a die. These are the things that you have to do, the little things to get out in front, to give yourself the maximum opportunity to disrupt their game plan. Yeah, and I think that was one of the the points of uh, like my losing in the in the top against Vader is like I just felt like I wasn't getting out ahead mm-hmm. and I'd have to rewatch everything and see what I was doing but yeah I just I couldn't get ahead so it's like my force jump couldn't work to blank Vader 
uh, I couldn't get the anger. Exactly. Force jump's another reason why you need to get in the pool first. Force jump's ideal because it synergizes with anger and it allows you to blank evade or die at a later point in the game. Not to mention the plays that you have once you have force speed yep. in the pool on a special. Yeah, it definitely made uh, uh, my life a little bit harder not being able to get out in front, but that's just kind of how it went. So it's it, to me, again, I don't think this is the like the deck. Like I don't think it's going to come close to matching uh, like Vader Greedo's 48% of regionals so far or whatever it was. Like, I don't think it's going to get there, but I'd be surprised if it didn't make noise going forward. Whether or not it wins one, you know, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a lot, but... There there are... There's so much tech uh, against this. I mean, you can see fear, Feel Your Anger gets slotted back in. You can see Mind Trick gets slotted back in, maybe over Beguile if it becomes really popular. Although I don't really think it's going to become that popular. But I, I just... I, it's this deck is a lot easier to counter than Vader. Vader, you really got to get creative to counter. You have to have. I mean, we're talking about minute lines of sequencing your turn. I mean, it's it's way easier to counter something like this than it is to counter Vader. Oh, definitely. And I mean, that kind of goes back to the idea of Vader of why, like, he's doing so well with things. But looks like Scott has some internet problems, so he dropped out. So we'll just keep on uh, chugging along a little bit. Um, should I start dropping F bombs so it feels like he's here? No, that's okay. That's okay. Okay. All right. So I mean, with this point, like I mean, so we feel currently you and I that Tarkin Stoke is probably a solid option going forward. Depends on what gets teched into decks. Like you said, if people start doing even one of a fear your anger can just blow you out. Um, yeah, uh, you lose a turn. Yep. Uh, a mind trick is brutal too, and like that was one of the big things that like I feel like if that happened against Joe in my top eight. I probably would have lost those games because simply like, especially with his tech of like rebel trader, like if I activate Tarkin next action, he activates uh, the trader. Now I have to activate Snoke. And then if he just like plays mind trick that next turn, you know what I mean? Like yeah. some of these, yeah, could feel- it's, it's brutal. Yep. It's tough. And that's, that's why we're trying to run uh, as many things as we can to prevent that. Like, you know, stifle and probe and you, you gotta, you're trying to get Tarkin into the pool early and often so that you can threaten with that discard side. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that are going into, you know, trying to counter the things that burn you the most. You don't want to get jumped on. No deck wants to have be jumped on, but uh, we found in testing that this deck is susceptible to jump and retreat. So we're, we're trying to take uh, all those things into account. Yeah. I actually didn't play any, any jump decks. I don't, and currently I'm trying to recount everything. I don't remember playing any, no speed decks, no action cheaty decks, really. I think they, I saw a few out there, but I personally did not play against any. Um, I mean, it's it's not unwinnable because we, we found, I mean, the, it went back and forth. But I mean, if they really got going and, and there was a super aggressive build, you could get burned um, with, a, with a jump. Yeah, and I think what's, you know, interesting too, like when you think of Tarkin, you think of bad matchups into the three wide. But um, ultimately, like... Against Joe, his 11, 20, 28 health. Yeah. And I, well, game one, I won pretty well, but I think that was Joe, like, not playing against Tarkin in forever and getting discarded round one and two, which is tough for any deck to really deal with, except Vader, I guess. I discarded him his whole hand, like, three times in a row, and it <laughs> literally didn't matter. Um, but, uh, yeah, there was just, uh, with him, like, it was just a, uh, a lot of health to chew through, but still I was able to keep up and even outpace him. And, you know, the second game was much more down to the wire. Uh, if he was a little bit more prepped against Tarkin Stoke, I'm sure he would have been able to pull it out. But I mean, I think that just kind of shows that even in our bad matchup of three wide, like we're still okay. Well, I, here's what I'd say to that. I mean, you have Snoke who's, who's dealing a little extra damage, you know, helping your, your win condition. Granted, you're doing the same thing to Tarkin, but, um, in in the villain three wide matchup, it's a little different because there predominantly is much less shields in in those decks than there are in the hero versions. Now both of them are going to have illusions, which are it's just something that as as a Tarkin player you have to deal with. It's always going to be a minimum value of four every turn that they play an illusion, um, and you just have to accept that. But when you start factoring in shields, in addition to that illusion, the hero matchup is much tougher uh, to overcome. That's why we we felt it necessary to include wave because that would be such a difficult hill to climb. 
Oh yeah, Wave Wave was uh, super clutch against me, and and like you said, Force Illusion really kills me. But and that was what killed me against uh, round five, six against Mill that I lost. I think it had to be round five, but I think I actually misplayed with that. I could have resolved a Force Wave, but instead I power actioned, not using the Force Wave, uh, other dice, and that let him Force Illusion all all four. But instead I could have uh, done the Force Wave. And then he could have only done two Diota on the Force Illusion, and the other two would have had to go on a Leia, so I could have had more damage. Stick, potentially. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like you said, I know it's a little bit different with that, but like at one point, uh, Joe was able to Snoke for shields. I think the traitor has shields on that character. And that's obviously not a normal line of play in the three-wide villain deck. But, I mean, still, just 28 health with Force Illusion is pretty rough. His mitigation package is... Um, was solid. I mean, they were all generally cheap yeah. stuff. Hidden motives. He doesn't like you. He had one mind trick. I don't remember if he had two or not, but I think just the fact that you can still burn through 28 health or whatever just kind of goes well into it. But obviously, the like you said, the issue is the hero decks, the three wide mill that's 27 health plus the amount of shields that they do, two, two second chance. Yeah, like they're they're rough. And you're not going to be able to snipe Yoda to, to get like a force jump off the table. You're, you're going to have to yeah, you can't you can't direct your damage uh, very much at all outside of fist and the LS one cannon. Yeah, well, it's true. Welcome back, welcome Scott. back. <laughs> Internet's stupid. It's a thing, dude. Ah! Um, you Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Al Gore. <laughs> he invented the internet. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so we were just talking about, like, uh, is Tark and Snoke going to stick around? We were still kind of diving into that to specific matchups and stuff. So you were kind of saying that you liked it, Scott, before you, you cut out a little bit. You think it'll stick around? I said it wasn't the worst thing Tommy's ever come up with. Tommy comes yeah. up with a Ray 1 deck every six seconds. I like Ray 1. Dude, Ray 1 uh, lay is going to be a thing, dude. So yeah, if, talk to Flockton. I was about to say, Tommy, you want to like know what it's like to live in Flockton's head sometime? You're Flockton adjacent... With the Ray One, yeah, but sometimes my stuff, like I throw it at the wall and it sticks. Yeah, so I said Flockton adjacent. <laughs> I think basically, if you make a deck and you run it by Flockton, and if it gets his approval, you just throw it out, just right there, <laughs> right on the spot. <laughs> don't, don't touch it again. <sighs> we kind of talked. We think it, it's it's solid. Don't see it being the top deck, but one of the better ones that could be in the meta. But with Vader, like. At what point, like, everybody's teching against him and he's still winning, you know? So what is it, like, is it you just stop and do we just run Vader and just go back into the R2-P2 world of everybody's running the same deck? Or is there still more room to uh, for us to be pushing? I mean, I think did, still did, you play, push. did you play Vader otherwise in the event? No, I actually avoided him. Somehow. Wow, you were, yeah, well, I guess you gotta see, gotta see in that regard, but, like, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose to Vader sometimes. It's going to happen. It's just going to happen. And part part of the Vader success, and by no means all of it, am I saying, is attributed to this, but part of it is that it is a deck that's going to be represented by far more players than, than you know, Tarkin Snoke or, you know, Kit Ayla or Mill. Like, not as many people are going to play these decks, but a lot of people are going to play Vader. Yeah, and I, I think that's what, like, played into the r2p2 world before too like eventually people realize how good that deck was and it's like if i'm showing up to a tournament why bother bringing anything else so it's like r2p2 won everything sure it also had like 90 percent of the field running that deck but yeah like, but it was it, just because it was established did it but it it also won things before people were running it i don't know if there's ever been a point pre or post uh rg that vader wasn't such a giant part of the field i mean i, I yeah it was with all that unknown a lot of people just said i'm turning to vader because i know it will work to some extent and i have a comfort level i want to win some games it's fun to win games i'm going to go to this because my floor is going to be you know much higher than it would be if i took some crazy you know untested stuff in this crazy meta but i know vader is somewhat of like a constant He's the North Star. There you go. The North Star. But didn't Vader Greedo did they didn't it win one regional before the, the rules reference hit? Like when Thrawn Snoke was in its prime? It's possible. I, I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I'm not 100 percent either. But it's like just like if something like that is true as well. But I can I can even I would imagine even even at that tournament it was probably still. It wouldn't surprise me if it was like the second or the most played deck. No, when Thrawn Snoke was a thing, I bet you that was like filling the field everywhere. You mean Thrawn even Snoke if, was everywhere? I'm I'm sure. Thrawn Snoke might have been, but I'm saying Vader probably wasn't like it wasn't as if there was two people at the event running Vader, both making the top cut with it. Uh, I mean, I think that's fair, but I still don't see it being like a majority. I don't know. I like as it continues going, like I feel like more people and more people are just going to start running it at this point. Like with I the agree. field, it's like it's he's everywhere, sure, but like still, I don't know. It's just it's just doing so well, even with like everybody's teching against him. Well, here's and here's still here's winning. why it's it's worth not play not buying in on Vader. Here's the reason why: because if you crack the code and counter Vader and make your Vader win percentage 90 percent, then you're gonna have you're just gonna walk the whole field. You're just gonna clean up Swiss. You're gonna get in top cut. You're gonna play a couple off decks, and then you got you know another Vader matchup. Isn't that isn't that carrot on the end of that stick worth pursuing? Especially if if you don't find Vader uh, fun to play, or you know, and like th- there's not a, a whole lot of depth to the Vader plays. Oh, I totally no, I totally am on board with that idea, and that's why I haven't brought him to either regional I've been to. Like it just doesn't interest me. I'm I'm like sure I'll concede the point of he's the best deck, but that doesn't mean that I personally want to play him. I'm much more interested in potentially trying to find something that could crack the code as you said like to me like if i were to able to find a deck that just beats him i would much rather do that than just running what is established and also you could open up yourself you you could just pair into a round because a deck just is 100 percent tech against you beats you but loses against everything else in the field and you just lost to the deck that was tech against you and then your strength of schedule is trash and you're the vader deck that didn't make cut yeah so there there's a lot of downs like 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 you said, everybody's tacking against you if you're running Vader. There is it's a it's it's an easy deck to play, but it is an uphill battle. If there's if the fifty percent of the field is playing Vader, it's not like if a Vader deck wins, you win. I mean, you're still competing against all these Vader decks. Does Vader counter Vader, or is that just a game of chance, or does the better player always win that matchup? I I'm not convinced the better player always wins that matchup. No. I, in general, with against Vader, I'm not sure that the better player wins every time. The person that wins the battlefield yes, wins. Yes, more often than not, yeah. that is 100% the case. Yeah. Like, and it's going to be, it's going to be to a larger degree than normal because in not feed matchups, the battlefield may or may not be worth two shields. In the feed matchup, the battlefield is unequivocally worth like five shields. <laughs> yeah. At least more than two. It's definitely worth more than two. Five might be... I don't know. Five, five might be... We should be playing Name <laughs> That... You remember that like old like 80s, 70s uh, game show, Name That Tune? I can name the song in four notes. I can name the song in three. Name That Tune. That We should be bidding shields for, for Theed. It, it's definitely got to be like four or five. Is where I would put it at. I mean, I think an interesting point too, like just food for thought too, is like... Uh, Vader Greedo is dominating the field, but on the I Rebel report, Vader Greedo has uh, a total of 29 top four appearances, which is 29%, so out of 100, or I guess 25 regionals. Um, 29 appearances, 29% making the top four, but 48% of winning decks, which is interesting. So even though it's not like, yeah, it's, that's... it's still the most, like, by, like, the next percentage is Dooku Talzin in second with six appearances at 6%. So it's obviously still way further than anything else. But, I mean, it's interesting that its winning percentage is still much higher than its appearance percentage. The one thing that is absolutely missing and would be absolutely integral and um, really relevant to, to talks about stuff like representation and, you know, is a deck to... Is is the total of how many of those decks are in the event, and that's unfortunately just never information yeah. we're going to get because, you know, FFG doesn't tell TOs to to do that stuff, and who knows if they're even asking for deck lists. 
Yeah, that, I would love if they had that information available, but that is a uh, unless we specifically run an event. Yeah, it's just take not going to happen. Information and put it out there. That's not going to be a. Yeah, it, it's up to the players really, and maybe the TO has motivation, but generally, it's one out mm-hmm. of every like twenty regionals is going to get all that information out there. Well, yeah, I mean, do you guys have any other thoughts like about the meta as a whole, Vader as a whole, like? I I got a little bit more. All right, let's hear it, Scott. All right, people. If you go into an event, you're bringing you're bringing a deck, any deck. It seems to be the Vader decks that are, are the culprit. You have to know what your cards do. You, it's you 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 can't be going through the event misrepresenting what your cards do to your opponent. Yeah, your your opponent's there, and they they might know better than you, and they might correct you. And you know your opponent's involved in the game too. But if you're if you're telling your opponent that your cards work the wrong way especially especially when it's a way that benefits you for them to work that way that's messed up that's really messed up you're going to get away with it a lot of times and you know if that's happening multiple times in the event multiple times in a game especially that's a problem and you, you gotta you you you're the one causing the issue there you gotta know what your cards are it's just you know it's it's something that like players we need to take more of responsibility to you know make sure that we're not telling our opponent the wrong interpretations when our opponent's like, oh, does that card in your deck work that way? Because guess what? The person that's bringing the card should know how it works more than the opponent that did not bring the card. Don't tell me how to play the game, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the, there's one more thing, and this is is another caveat. And this this is just something that needs to, to stop in total. Like, TOs need to be announcing it before the event that it should not be happening. We cannot be using our regular game tokens as our power action tokens. You cannot be using shields, yeah. uh, damage di- damage tokens, resource tokens as your power action tokens. That's just really bad bookkeeping because inevitably what's going to happen if you play an event like that where you're putting a resource on your character, guess what's going to happen? That resource at some point in the in the turning of your things, in the dice bouncing around, and you, you moving damage on, taking shields off, all of that, that resource token is going to end up a little bit to the side of the character. And then when you're at the end of the round and you're looking around, you're like, oh, why is this resource not in my resource pile? And you're going to put it there. That's definitely going to happen at least once, if not multiple times through an event. And that's you gaining an advantage because you're keeping your stuff sloppy and you're not taking the extra six seconds effort to find spare change in your pocket to use for a power action token. It just, it's, it, that can't happen. Like if it's, if you're a TO and you're actually like watching the games being played and you see someone using a power action token, that's another token on the board as well. You just got to stop them and tell them that they need to use anything else, like anything else. I mean, at, at this point, power actions have been a thing for three sets now. And they're not going anywhere. We should every player should find a different token to use as their power action tokens. It just you should. And if your opponent is is using something that could be you know confusing, uh, you should offer them your tokens potentially, or ask them to change out one of their tokens because it's 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 going to cause issues. You know, and and who's to say that if it does accidentally make a resource accidentally makes it into their pool and you call a TO over, you don't know what's going to happen once a TO comes over. Yeah. It, you don't know. It's, it's you, it's, he said, she, she said at that point, and you know, it's a coin flip for who's going to get the game state, uh, you know, to reflect what they want. Because here's the reality. And you know, this is, if, if I were TO owing an event, I think this would be the reality for any good TOs. If they were to be called over to a table and someone saying there's an extra resource in his resource pile because he's using resources as his power action tokens on his character, guess what? That TO has to side with the player saying that extra resource is there because you are well, creating this. You, I mean, I'm just saying. In theory, Scott. In I, theory. I'm, I'm, I'm saying if the TO's got if, – if you're approaching it with any any sense to the situation because at that point, you're the one creating the situation that's going to cause that to happen. So you're telling me if I want an extra resource around, on top of Theed, I can just put a resource token on my character. Then when they call the judge on me, uh, I'll be good to go? 
I mean, yep. with with yeah. I mean, if hey Jack, you had cool. the to the top top cut of that event. I don't know <laughs> what would you have ruled. Uh, I would, <laughs> I would have disqualified everybody and went down to the next placed player that was still there, which uh, would have been so yourself. Would be me. Yeah, and I would have won the <laughs> tournament. <laughs> yep. See, I mean that, that's that's always right. that's always an option. Okay. But I'm I'm saying like players, if you got to you got to find a different power action token. It can't be. It can't be your actual to- like your regular normal tokens. I yeah, I'm pretty lucky. I have the the hyperloops one, and I have like two artificery ones. So it's I, I tell my are you being that as are well, you like, did, did you did you get paid to throw in those advertisements? Yeah, every time I say another content creator, it's like ten bucks goes into my account. Wow, I mean, right now, that's amazing. Uh, uh, Discard to reroll is currently using our Patreon Discord <laughs> to record his show, so I'm expecting a check in the mail soon. From, and he uh, didn't even from ask any of us he to even be asked. on. <laughs> Mike Jem asked. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Jem was like, "Hey, these guys don't know how to use Discord, please, Jack or Tommy. Can you drag us into your private recording one? We're like, sure. <laughs> Whatever you guys need. Whatever Drug. chip needs, he gets. Whatever." <laughs> Mr. Princess, Princess Chip. Um, yeah, I let them use my power action tokens because I I don't like not using tokens because I hate that debate later up, like in the round. It's like, oh, did I use this? Um, you know, and just avoiding that conversation at like by any means necessary is, is going to be beneficial to you in the long run. Now, I mean, it might be beneficial or detriment to you because they're like, oh, I didn't put the token on there. I know I didn't use it yet. I'm going to do that real quick. But I mean, I'd rather them do that than uh, have that debate come up several times about misplaced tokens or whatever it might be. Yeah, it's it's just you know, like bad keep keeping a sloppy board is just how you make mistakes, whether they're mistakes that end up hurting you or benefiting you. I mean, if you make a mis- if you keep a sloppy board and you make a mistake that benefits you, I mean, hurts you, serves you right. Don't keep a sloppy board. But if you make a mistake that benefits you because you're keeping a sloppy board state, you kind of suck. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're hurt. You're taking something away from, you're taking a fair game away from your opponent. And that should be the thing that we as players, that should be like winning an event should be goal one B when going to an event, but goal one A should be playing the game with as the, the utmost integrity. And that starts with like making sure everybody knows what's going on on your board and it's all, you know, clean and fair. So should we talk about that? Tommy's told me that you don't, you don't play clean. Scott, I, I said in up. the past testing, Scott has had his stuff all over the board. Oh no, I am <laughs> in, t- in testing. It's real bad. Like I get real lazy in uh, casual it's, environments with stuff. I steal people's, like, I steal people's where, tokens. How many resources do you have? Are, is the one off the mat? Does that count as well? Like what's <laughs> happening here? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's real bad then, but in tournaments it's not, because I care about other people no, yeah. that aren't Tommy. No, never had an issue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did I hear that? Is that true? All right, we got confirmation. Scott cares for people that aren't Tommy. That's that's news to me. Uh, I want to circle back real quick before we uh, finish up. Just the changes to to OP. I want to hear your guys' thoughts on the the move to to quarter four. I only care about one thing, and it's that. ABG said that there's maybe a rumor floating or people are talking about it. If they move worlds to PAX Unplugged, I would I would lose my mind. I would my heart would swell and burst. I'd be so happy. I um I, and it's feasible because PAX is ha, unplugged from year one to year two uh has grown substantially. And as far as GQs go, they've had probably the best turnouts. Um, at, at the very least, um, you know, in the conversation for the best turnouts. So that could be on the table for them. It fits the time frame, and it, it could be uh, a venue uh, for them because they have moved like Imperial Assault and some other things to different conventions as opposed to having it at their home center. So they might be moving away from that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would... I. It's tough for me to say that FFG is going to be... Moving, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, Philadelphia is no harder to get to than Minnesota. If anything, it's probably easier. I realize it's on the East Coast, but it's still easier to get to than Minnesota for, for a lot of people. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean that. I just mean FFG moving an event they need to run out of their home area. But then again, they don't really run their events. 
They're not doing anything special. Uh, I mean, Nova. <laughs> well, I mean, Nova? what do they have to do out? They have to fly out. You know, some some of the uh, developers. That's I mean, you, you fly out a handful of people, and then Cascade runs it, or you know, like they have for Nova. Those guys run it. Like it's not like they don't outsource for tournaments being ran. And to be honest, the overwhelming majority of opinion seems to be that Cascade does a better job of running events than FFG themselves. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, like you said, Nova runs it themselves. You know, FFG is just kind of there. I think the interesting point with that then becomes like. Because what PAX Unplugged is really Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yes. I mean, if they, if they do the finals on Sunday, I guess it could still work out of two waves. But you know, with it being an open invite, you know, having it at Minnesota, and I think last year it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday was the waves, and then top, er, then day two and top cut was on Sunday, Make, which like allowed for more people. Like I don't like do here's you the lose thing. people by PAX Unplugged. So PAX Unplugged may expand to Thursday. If that if that convention continues to grow, maybe they open up four days. I think they should. They they I wouldn't were be awesome I wouldn't be here. surprised at all if it opened up to four days after yeah. being there the past two years and seeing the growth. Yeah. Can can PAX Unplugged fit a four hundred person, three hundred person FFG event? Yes. If, if there's three waves, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean like I think, like you said, PAX Unplugged is doing great, and I think it's almost not rivaling Gen Con, but like I've always wanted to go to Gen Con with how well PAX Unplugged is doing. Like I don't feel the need currently. It's been it's been emulating to Gen Con to a degree. There, the, it seems like they're following that kind of uh, setup, which is a good thing. Here's the thing: you've never been to Gen Con, Jack. I have not. So again, that's PAX a, Unplugged is is well below Gen Con as far as like the overall mm-hmm. gaming experience. Tommy and I, what we went into the PAX Unplugged Hall and we're like, eh, there's not really anything we need to do here. And like the Gen Con Hall, you get like lost for days in that. Yeah, I can imagine that. Like I said, that came from inexperience. Like I'd still like to go to Gen Con, but 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 it did look like the Gen Con Hall. At a, like we were like, it, oh, it, like we, we're approaching. We that. started looking. We started looking for the things that we would normally expect to find, and we didn't find them. Then we we're like, all right, it's not. Um, it's not it implications of that if it gets moved to quarter four implications from february to when does store champ start <laughs> it may June. i i mean at this point what you got people like a year and a half ago are going to be yep having a buy I, it's all worth it if they <laughs> fix things that's that's what it comes down to it's it's yeah it it's wonky they're gonna have to reorganize like they might have to shift like store championships regionals around they might have to do a lot of logistical work from that standpoint but if if things get fixed if we get a bigger better worlds if we get a bigger better tournament circuit if there's more people that can qualify for worlds then it's all worth it even if some people have to wait an extra few yeah, months i think that's fine i think you make the winners of gen con nova they all get tickets to this upcoming Worlds, and now you have two people that won Nationals and all that go into the same one, but I think that's just fine, and then you're all caught up, and hopefully you fix. It, I mean, if if you won Worlds and Nationals or and or Nationals or North American Championship, you should probably have an invite every year if you want it. I mean, that's pretty. That's a pretty massive accomplishment. Yeah, I could get by. Yeah. That. Yeah, I, I, I'm right with you, uh, Tommy. If they – time will tell, I think – it might stink with this lull from February to to May, if that's whatever it might be. But, you know, maybe we can, you know, personally organize something in South Jersey area, maybe try to do stuff. Yeah. And it stinks that it has to be on the community in that way. But if it's better for the long haul of the game, then obviously I'd rather them do that. It's always on well, the community yeah. anyway. Yeah, it's yeah. not That's not a new thing. But, I don't know. I hope they do it. I hope it's a structure where, like, store champs are – Early in the year, like quarter one, quarter two is regionals, quarter three is uh, Gen Con and Nova, and then quarter four wraps up with um, Worlds, and then do like release kits within there. Like I would love that if they did like similar to X-Wing structure, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but other than that, guys, you have any other closing thoughts on Meta, OP, Destiny, Tark and Snoke? Uh, just thoughts on Tommy in general? You know, anything you want to say about Tommy, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got a lot of things to say about Tom. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, but what about Shane? We haven't passed at Shane. At this point, it's just like is Shane going to show up anywhere? <laughs> it's like Shane going to show up to his own wedding? No. Nah. Yeah, that's the question. T- tell him there's a Destiny tournament there, and he won't. 
Uh, we we got to get if we, yeah, we got to get his fiance to play Destiny, and then he'll he'll you know he'll hang out. I don't think I think she played like once, and she's like I'm out. Yeah, Shane. You know, at this point, it's like making fun of a kid who's just like not there, talking behind his back. You know, maybe one day he'll stream Fortnite with Mended, and you know he'll come back. But who knows? <laughs> All right, he could be pr- he could be proving his Iden deck right, and you just mm, yeah, yeah, yeah doesn't want to. Oh, Flockton thinks it good. So again, if we're going by what Flockton thinks is good to what is good, just toss it. Just toss it right in the trash. (laughs) But any closing thoughts, guys? We will wrap up at this point. We're just making fun of Shane, which isn't a bad thing. But Uh, I think I I got I got my thoughts out. I yelled. (laughs) Cool. Tommy, you got anything? Not nada. All right. As always, guys, you can check us out on Facebook. Uh, Twitter, we're on Twitch, YouTube, all that good stuff. We will be streaming one more regional, New Jersey. Uh, we might try to do Maryland if I if Flockton can get his life together, but that is unguaranteed. I'm trying uh, to make but, Jersey. I want to be there so bad. Do it, Tommy. Have the kid like strapped around you as you play. He'll be fine. Yeah, I don't know why Tommy doesn't get a baby Bjorn and just sit little Tom, little, little well Thomas because name confusion. Uh, you know, just sit him in front of him and just have the little kid roll dice. Kid rolls dice. He he does. It's actually adorable when he rolls dice. And then you know, after like the fourth or fifth time, it ends up in his mouth. Here's the thing, time. though. Like everybody's seen the movie The Hangover, right? The scene where Zach Galifianakis has the little baby and they're like at brunch and he's like, ha ha, look what the little baby's doing. A little bit, you know, that would be kind of like that scene if Tommy was like just trying to stick dice in his hand. Be a little weird. I mean, Tommy's a little weird guy, but we'll uh, Fair close enough. up big Tommy, not a little Tommy. That's um, right. <laughs> I'll take the bullet for my kid. We'll wrap up here. Uh, but yeah, Tommy, I'll give you the closing words since you're the, the madman behind... Uh, Tark and Snoke. Uh...